this guy's been a great friend for us and our show ever since we started, Bill Mendoza. And if you're in the archery world whatsoever, you already know the name. And uh, Bill and his team at No Limits Archery do a great, great job there. And uh, if you found what I've found, a lot of your bigger box stores and other type places just do not have the quality of professionals there that know what they're talking about, just to be quite honest with you. So these guys know what they're doing, everything about archery. We highly, highly endorse them. They're the only archery place in the state that we stand behind because we know the service you're going to get there and uh, just the way that they do business. So. Phil Mendoza, you're going to learn a lot here about archery. The seats in the back cost just as much as the seats in the front. So if you guys want to move up where you can hear a little bit, I know Phil will save some time for some questions later, okay? So let's give him a good hand. Thanks, Scott. Welcome, everybody. Sunday almost lunchtime, right? Try to make it not too long so we can not miss our midday meal. Um, I'm Phil Mendoza. I have uh, been doing a few different seminars here the last few years, and uh, I, like Scott mentioned, I own No Limits Archery. We're the biggest private facility in, in the state, archery-wise, indoor range, outdoor range. Uh, we're trying to expand our reach, not necessarily from the pro shop aspect, uh, but from the educational aspect. So I appreciate the ISC's platform here to uh, extend this to me. So, when I was thinking about the, changing the topics up a little bit for this, this, this session, uh, last year I talked about buck fever, wrote a short booklet on that, and it's, it's, it hits, hits home with that, that topic with a lot of people, and whether it's target panic, you want to call it, or buck fever, it's at some point affected everybody in some way, right? So I started thinking, it's like, well, I want to talk about that a little bit again, but, you know, how do I better inform you, educate you, and, and show you how to apply it to, to what your system is and what you're doing in the field. So I'm in the midst of, of finishing our second, my second booklet with some, some work that I'm doing with a whole new shift in focus in, in education that we're working on. So I sent out a, a survey. I picked out uh, a handful of people from my email list and I sent them a personal email and I actually was looking for feedback because what I see and what I plot, what I assume is common topics and uh, issues that, that many people have from my perspective, I wanted to see it from your perspective. So I sent this, this survey out and it was interesting because I, I alluded a little bit about the work that I'm working on, sent it out, the title that I was looking to potentially title it, and about half of the feedback I got was on that exact topic, okay? But the title itself didn't do justice to inform people of what it was about. So that, that survey did two things for me. It, it, it gave me a better perspective of other topics that I needed to touch, touch on, and I needed to hone in my, my work that I was continue, uh, working on right now. So some of those topics, that, that got brought up were obviously learning more about your setup, right? Aero builds, um, tuning, all things your your equipment and wanted to be more knowledgeable about it. Another thing that, that came up was yardage judging in the field or in competition. Uh, those of you who have, again, heard me speak before, I was a competitive archer for about seven years on a national level and, and more so before that. I've reached the highest level from a divisional standpoint, competed there for a short time before I had my second little one, and business has since taken over. But I learned so much in those few years competing, working through the amateur ranks into the professional division, and that topic, I, I love talking about yardage judging. That's something that I, I had to work twice as hard as, as a lot of other people just because of the region and the, the places we were shooting tournaments in. That was something I, I, I love talking about. Target panic was another one, and it's something that I'm, I'm kind of phasing is a situational archery. Situational archery being the events that happen in the field. How do I know to take it from point A to point B? How do I know if I'm if my setup is effective out to a certain range? How do I know when I should be shooting, when I should not be shooting? Okay? So that's how I, I cluster that last category based off of a, a lot of things. And that last category is specifically what my this next piece of 
the short book that we're writing, and all of our training sessions that we're going to be moving forward into is specifically about. So, starting with topic number one, know your setup. First thing I'm going to say, this, this topic right here, most people overcomplicate it, okay? From the standpoint of, you've got your arrows, you've got your bow, and you've got you. And when we're talking about, hey, what setup's right for me? Okay, well you have constants. Your draw length is fixed, right? The poundage you're comfortable pulling varies a little bit, but it's, it's pretty much fixed. Then when you take this, your, your components, your arrows, the systems that are out there are pretty much fixed. You've got some options within the range per inch range, which is the point tip width, point range. But for the most part, those are black and white. Okay? The, then you take the uh, your bow setup, your arrow setup, then you take your own setup, and it's something that, that's a common question to you. What kind of tip weight should I be shooting? What kind of, uh, what kind of arrow should I shoot? What's the straightness? Is this better than that? Well, obviously, products get priced by virtue of premium products are more expensive, arrow specifically, right? Straight, a straighter arrow costs more money than a less straight arrow. And if you're talking about what do I think is best, well obviously, yes I do sell this equipment, but I also use the equipment, and I've tested a lot of this equipment in extreme situations. The straightest setup, the straightest arrow and components you can get is better for many reasons. Will you see that as you apply it into the field? That depends, that's, how, that's on you, on that third component, which is you, and how you fit yourself into that puzzle, Will you ever see the difference between a point oh oh one oh oh three straightness arrow? Maybe, maybe not. You know, some some of those things don't show themselves to a further distance. But arrow spine is a, a specific topic that I want to touch on. I'm a proponent in a heavier hunting arrow. Okay, 450, 500 grain hunting arrow. I've shot elk in the shoulder with the 400 grain arrow and didn't recover that animal. Thought I lost an animal. Luckily, the specific situation, the last time it happened to me, another group of guys saw that bull chase the cow the next day. So I didn't get very much penetration in it. You know, I had a little bit of blood, shoulder, shoulder wound, flesh wound, and I started evaluating my setup. If any of you have looked online and done any research on kinetic energy, momentum, and, uh, and how it applies to your own setup, you, you may or may not have tripped over East. Easton put out a, a study or a recommended starting point for kinetic energy for small game, mid-sized game, large game. Okay? When you start plugging in your setup to those recommended formulas, it, that starts to paint the picture. That starts to make it clear for you. Uh, my setup that I've chosen to shoot this last year was just shy of 500 grains on a hunting arrow. To get the speed that I wanted to get, I had to shoot 78 pounds on a bow. That's not for everybody, right? Somebody's going to be, I don't want to shoot more than 65 pounds. Okay, well, let's work backwards. So instead of looking at a chart and working forwards as to this spine is recommended and this tip weight is what you should shoot, how about we start working backwards? Let's look at the chart that says you should be shooting 62-ish pounds of kinetic energy for all things large game. Are you in that range right now? If you are, you need to get into that range with, by means of either pulling more weight or using a heavier arrow. Then let's work backwards. Okay, let's work into, now you can more specify, I want to shoot 125 grain tip, or I want to shoot 100 grain tip with 40 grains of insert weight. So now you can start working backwards to your setup and achieve an arrow build that's going to be a custom building components dialed into you. That's one of the big questions I was getting. One of the next questions I was getting into, and before I get into tuning, broadhead selection was another one that came up huge, right? What broadhead should I use? I try to use different broadheads every year, and I've had some broadheads over the years that I love. I, I mean, there's no reason for me to change. But from a standpoint of what we are as an establishment to try to better inform my, the consumers as to this is good, this is okay, and this is maybe not as good, that's why I really try to experiment and try different things out within the realm of how I'm going to better relate it to individual setups. Expandable broadheads, cut on contact broadheads. You know, what should I shoot? How much tip weight again? I would sooner say if you're, again, if you're working yourself backwards from that starting point, and you say, my setup is in the mid-50 pound kinetic energy range, I'm going to tell you, if you're shooting big game, probably do not shoot an expandable broadhead. It's just, it, it's, you're losing kinetic energy on impact, some more than others. You're probably not going to get a pass through. So to think that if you can shoot a fixed blade broadhead, stays in the cavity, continues doing damage as it's in there cutting, that's what you want. 
those, are, those other of you that have that high kinetic energy that pass throughs are more likely, you have more flexibility. You have more ability to try different things and, and experiment there. Expandables are also, um, you just, your, your range opens up, I should say. Now, I personally have issues with some of the current big game regulations within our own state, right? I don't, I don't, uh, I'm, I'm not the law, everybody has opinions, but I just, looking at those kind of charts, and then some of the studies that we've done where I'll shoot out of my bow, 71, 72 pounds, I'll shoot an arrow, point blank through a chronograph. I'll get a speed, I'll get a kinetic energy reading, and I'll calculate my momentum. Throw the chronograph at 40 yards. Shoot that arrow through the chronograph at 40 yards. Same thing, calculate that, that measurement. Then I'm gonna back up and I'm gonna do the same thing from square one with a heavier arrow. Point blank, 40 yards. Some of the things I started realizing is that heavier arrow, 50, 60 grains more, was carrying more energy at 40 yards than my lighter one was at point blank. So to think that when you start talking about the defective range, when you start talking about what setup is gonna be right for you, all those things need to come into play. And that's where the big game regulation to say 35 pounds of draw weight or plus, that's throwing a dart at a dartboard. Okay, so from the standpoint of being better educated, understanding your setup, and taking it to the next level to be effective and efficient, it starts right there. Getting into tuning. Uh, tuning, you know, Hoyt put out, I went through a Hoyt, uh, Hoyt school. We, as dealers, we get invited to do a lot of warranty schools and technical uh, learning. I've been to the Matthew School and the Hoyt School. I've got some other techs that have been to PSE School, Botech School. And there's a lot of interesting information that gets proposed to us. But one of the things that, just the definition, the simple definition of tuning, bow tuning. What is bow tuning, right? Hoyt told us at their education, very one first thing is said, it's harmonizing the system of the shooter, the arrow, and your bow. And every one of those three spokes is equally as important to each other. You can look on paper and say, this is my bow. You can look on paper and say, this is my arrow setup, which matches what that bow should be. But here's me, and I have bad habits. And I punch the trigger, and I grip the bow too bad, or too, uh, of the wrong way. I put torque in it. What are we doing? You know, we've got the weak flaw is, is usually the, the Indian that's, that's, that's running the whole thing. So understanding that when we have tuning issues, as a pro shop, we can help you with the bow and the arrow. We'll tune your bow to one of to, to one of us, but as you add you that third component in there, that's that other third critical component. So anytime somebody tunes your bow, says shoot the bow hole, it's clean, it, you're you're good. Or a bear shaft tune, it's good. Until you can achieve the same results, technically that tune is not complete. So understand that there's so many area, elements and variables that are inherent from this system by virtue of everybody has a different, you know, bigger hand, thinner hand. They apply pressure differently. They feel comfortable holding a bow a little bit differently. So that system is super important from the standpoint of it needs to be in harmony. Where to start? You know, well, hey, I'd like to start working on my own bow. I'd like to start figuring out more if I can fix something in the field. Uh, you know, I'm having this issue, troubleshooting it. Identifying that this is a very common problem. We started doing workshops and seminars at, at the shop. My goal is here within the next month, we're gonna start recording some of those because I've been doing them the last two months at the shop. I did some last year. We're gonna start filming those and clipping them down and editing them. But I'm gonna be able to offer them as an online course. If you don't, if you know, people that aren't in the area or they can't make it to the specific time, you're still gonna be able to get some of that same information and learn how to apply it to your setup. So this is something specifically that we're working on to help you from the tuning standpoint because again, you're talking about the different, the different methods of tuning a bow, how it applies to certain things, and, and all things harmonizing that system. There's troubleshooting, there's things that, that help more than others. But the one thing I'll tell you here today is that what I like to do in my setup, what we like to do in our shop, we get your bow set up. If we're going to do a full tune and a string install, whatever the case is, or you come in before season, you want your bow tuned. You're going to try to get your bow into manufacturer specs, starting specs, it's number one if your string and cables will allow. If your string and cables are old and stretched, there's only so much we can do with that. So that's where a lot of times we recommend that you update your string and cables. That being said, manufacture starting, starting point. From there we take it and we'll actually paper tune your bow at, at point blank range, three to five yards. We'll take that and make adjustments as necessary and then that's kind of where we stop. Is there other methods of tuning? Yes, there's many. 
Do they all apply? It depends. Is it target, are you a target shooter or are you a hunter? What I would say is that final step, that next level of taking your setup to the next level, achieving maximum accuracy, efficiency, effectiveness, broadhead tuning, bear shaft tuning, that's where I take my next step. In a target atmosphere, I'm going to go group tune. I'm going to drop, I'm going to walk back tune. So that's where we stop at a good starting point to add you into that system. Okay, so that's where we, where we believe the most effective way to do it is. So understanding where, where we go with that. Some of these videos that we're going to start offering online, some of the, the seminar, the workshop that we offer in our shop, takes you and walks you through some of those steps to take it to the next level. Too much technical information to cover in, in five or ten minutes, but just know we have that available in, in, in our store. You can click on nolimitsarchery.com right now, and there's a scheduling tab. You can go right and schedule. Next thing, yardage judging for competition. Important topic, right? A lot of people want to shoot competitively. They want to, they want to go practice for the season. They want to be ready by the time the season comes. They want to start practicing all year. I love this because, you know, people bring in their kids. I, I like to take my son. We get out and shoot. You can do things in a fun atmosphere. Obviously, the level of interest and um, competitiveness you want to add to the situation varies. But yardage judging, in many cases, although there is a lot of mark yardage debate, or, uh, events now, this comes into play somewhere. A couple quick topics. This is another subject that I'm going to start working on as we get into spring. Our new facility, we have a huge outdoor range, 3D target set up uh, from using, it's going to be set up from March to October, November time frame. So these types of workshops and seminars, we're going to start working in the spring and through the summer. But a couple different methods that, that I've used uh, and applied to yardage judging for competition. Depending on how, what level, again, of competitiveness you want to get to, the, tar the, the target size, identifying and learning a yardage based off depth perception of a specific animal is the best way to go. The reason for that is, if you get in a dark tunnel situation when an animal is in a shaded area, it's going to look different to your eyes than if it's in a bright sunlight, open, wide, wide open area. If you get into a downhill situation and it looks like it's, oh, that's, that's, you know, that's really far down there, you know, unless you can identify an animal at a specific distance, and it takes a lot of practice, that's the best way. Target detail. A lot of people don't think of target detail. If you can think of, if you can look at an animal at 30 yards and you can make out the scoring rings on the vital and the eight ring, okay? Let's say that you take two or three steps back where you can't see those, those that vital ring anymore. That's a direct indicator right there that if you're not sure, is that target 33 or 34 yards or is that 28 or 29 yards? And I see the detail in the ring, I can see the detail in the ring. That's an indicator that it's closer than you think, right? Stuff like that, detail in an eye, the, the, the coloration of an eye of a, of a target. If you can pick that eye out at a certain distance and you know at a different distance you can't, direct indicator as to, you don't even have to start with, I think it's 40 plus yards or it's 30 plus yards. If you can start making out detail, again, that takes practice. That's something that I really prided myself in when I was shooting competitively because most of what we do in Colorado is more wide open shooting, there's some pine trees, if you go to where it's more competitive with ASA and IBO archery out east, midwest, you're shooting tunnels, you're shooting big canopies, you're shooting shade, you're shooting so many different situations that being able to identify an animal based off the animal itself, not the ground or uh, other, other factors, is, is the best way to do it. So detail and target size are key. There's a five yard method. You can spring a rope or you can throw cones every five yards and you can start looking at the ground and identifying what a certain distance looks like as you walk back. The problem I have with that is if you get to a 3D target in a tournament and you look down range and you say 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, what if you're off by a half a yard on every distance? Might as well, you're two to three yards off of the target. To be competitive, you need to be able to judge yards within a yard, in some cases two yards, but if you want to be competitive at the highest level, you need to judge within a, within a yard at all distances of 50 yards. And that's, that's the level of uh, skill that you have to have to shoot in the pro class. The, the 10 yard method, you can do the same thing, 10, 20, 30, 40. Those two methods I'm less of a fan of. I like more the halfway method. It was a method, what I would, my system, when I was judging yardage, I'd, I'd look at the target, I'd identify the target, and I would get a number in my head based off what I remember or relate, based off of, uh, depth perception. Okay, I think that target's 43 yards. Now I'm going to look at a halfway point between 
be in the target. I'm going to try to judge to the find the halfway point. Okay, I got that. Now I'm going to judge to the ground to the one spot and then double it. That's what the, that's the, the second system that I would use. Another way you can do, if you're looking at a an animal, you'll see sometimes you'll see people kind of doing this. You know, they're looking side to side at that animal. And that's another way of determining a midway point. If you can take the left side of the way you're looking at the target and draw a line to your right foot and the right side of the target to your, to your left foot, and you can same way try to achieve an X some point in the middle, that's going to help you determine that midway point. Judge to that, double it. If it's a further target, add an extra yard just in case, usually for insurance. Arrow's going to drop a little faster as you get out there. So that was my three-step method for judging a target. If you're getting into competitive archery, you have 30 seconds to a minute to judge a target and shoot an arrow, if you, depending on where you sit in the order. So that system has to happen quick, and you have to be very proficient at it. But that's what I would do in a competition uh, type setting. Yard is judging for hunting. This is one of the biggest things that I, that I heard from my response to my survey, and I didn't even, I know I have my system, I know what I do, but it, it was a huge issue. I, I couldn't believe how many responses I got on this specific topic. And so they say, well, you know, I want to learn how to judge yards because you don't always have time to pick up a range fight. And I would say that I am, I use a range finder 90% of the time. Even though I've practiced for years judging yardage and being proficient after 50 yards, my number is 40 yards, okay? 40 yards and in, I'm comfortable enough to judge that target within two yards and put a kill shot to vitals. Outside of 40 yards, I'm gonna to try to use a range finder. And that's just from insurance, that's just from, from being, uh, that's what I wanna know. So you know your capabilities first, right? Determine your absolute distance. Your absolute distance may be 20 yards. I can't judge past, you know, you might not be able to judge past 15 yards. Know your absolute distance. Because if you know that absolute distance, then that's, if you know that animal is in that, within that range, don't waste your time with extra movement or, or pulling up a range finder. You know you're comfortable to there. One more thing. Understand what your setup looks like at all distances. I don't, I mean, I, I would, I've shot a lot of high level competitions with a lot of people, but I love shooting with my peers, and I love shooting with my friends, and I love shooting with my son. And one of the things that always comes up, and I wish I could help somebody, but sometimes I don't want to be intrusive, but we'll get to a target that's 33 yards, and they'll miss. And they'll say, I must have overjudged it, I must have underjudged it. On my specific setup, and I don't shoot a, I shoot a 280, 285 feet per second bow. If I put my 20 yard pin at the top of the tent, my 30 yard pin is at the bottom of the tent. You can make a decent shot, you're going to stay on the animal, right? So, same thing, if you know what your setup looks like at, at a 40 yard target, a 35 yard target, at 35 yards, my 40 yard pin is about an inch and a half or so, two inches above the, the, the tin ring. My 40 yard pin is floating right at the bottom of the tin or just below. Know what that looks like. If you pull up on a target and, or an animal and you say, you know, at, at this distance, uh, a mule deer, for example, roughly 20 inches top of the back of the belly line, you, you pull up on a mule deer, you should know what your pins look like at that distance. You can mark a piece of tape on the wall and just walk back a distance, different distance, know what that looks like. Those are the kind of things that are going to, you don't need to be able to judge the 40 yards, but know what things look like at, through your sight at that distance. That's one thing to me that it's not cheating the system, it's just being smarter than, than what's, that, what, what's out there. There's some really good uh, bracketing tools that you can put on the site. Uh, they used to, there's a, a business that used to come out to the show here, and it's, it's, a, little, it's a little piece of uh, plastic that sticks on the inside of your site. You put fiber optics, and you walk back a certain distance. You've got to set it up to one animal. Uh, but you set you sight in a belly pin line, and then you, you mark on the wall the distance of the, the top of the back to the belly line. You draw your bow, and then you line up your belly pin, and you put a, a reference mark. At 20 yards, my, my green pin's at 20, this is where the top of the back is. You put your little fiber optic in there. Walk back to 30 yards, do the same thing. 40 yards, same thing. So now if you don't have time to draw, or to use your range finder, you can draw your bow back. Line up your pin on the belly line, and then see what pin corresponds on the top of the back. And if you color code it, you go to the side, that site and you aim and shoot. My brother shot his biggest bull today at 50 yards using that system because he didn't have time to range a bull, but he, was, he had that on his site, 330 inch bull. I mean, he would not have been able to shoot that if he wouldn't have had that system on his bow. So there, we have those in the shop 
and it's a great tool. Legal for 3D archery, so you know, but it is acceptable for hunting. I need a volunteer. Come on up, buddy. So, one thing I want to talk about. Dylan? Okay. Archery is not easy. Okay, archery is not easy. And when you talk about all the things that you need to be able to do within the system of just a shot, it's fun, right? It's addicting. But it's not easy. Take that pin in your right hand. Are you right hand or left hand? You shoot a ball right now? Okay. You're drawing this way, right? Just take that pin in your hand. Out in front of you, you can move that pin around your fingers, right? You can flip, you flip around your fingers a little bit. You know, roll it. Can you do this for me? Can you do this? Just flip around in between fingers. Okay? Now, I want to add a little element to that, okay? I'm going to put a little pressure. You, I want you to put resistance up, and I'm going to be pushing down. Okay? Go ahead and push up on my arm. Now, keep doing that with your fingers. Okay? Still do it there, but a little tougher, right? Now, let me add one more, let me add one more element to it. You take your left hand like if it, if it was your bow. Put your thumb, or like, thumb up like if it was your sight. I want you to aim with that thumb. See that curtain way back there, that white drop? Aim with that thumb like you're aiming at that target. You take this hand, I'm gonna put it back here, okay? I'm gonna put resistance on your hand. Go ahead, pull in, I'm gonna pull out. Aim, keep pulling. Now keep fumbling with that pin. Keep moving that pin around your fingers. You're doing a good job. Okay, but here's the deal. Good job, Bill, thank you. Here, I'm gonna get you a hat. What I'm trying to display here is, go ahead and pick a hat. You have a lot going on when you're shooting a bow. You have tension, you have resistance, your eyes are focusing on, on what you're trying to do with the sight, you're trying to execute a release, and you're trying to do it all at once. And if you don't have, if you, if you can't comprehend that you've got resistance, tension, and you're trying to do a fine motor skill, add the element of an adrenaline rush, animal, tournament, whatever the case is. A lot of people have a disconnect, and it starts right here. Okay, so that disconnect, causes us to focus on one thing more than the other. So, another, I mean, a question. When, when, you're, when you're shooting your bow and you've got all this going on, what do you guys focus on? Are you focusing on your sight, your pin, or your aiming? What do you, what, what do people, different people focus on at that point in time? Any, any, anybody? Breathing. breathing, okay? So you're focusing on breathing, and then where does everything else take place? What's next? But, but mentally, what are you doing? Okay, so you have a clear idea, a concept of what your sequence is and what you're looking for. Good. Anybody else? I mean, are they looking at your sight? You're looking at your bubble? What are different people look at when you're shooting? Anybody? Looking at your sight, right? Most times, your focus goes to your sight. When you're shooting your bow and you're focusing on your sight, what are you forgetting? Secondarily, you've got to still execute your shot. So if you're over... If, if you put too much focus on what's going on with your sight, you're forgetting about what's going on here. Sometimes you start to get weak, you start to break down, you start to snap shoot, you start to anticipate the shot. It causes all kinds of problems. And once you start doing it once, then you do it again, then you do it again, you're creating bad habits, right? You're taking and you're scooping a pile of crap on top of your shot sequence every time you shoot your bow. Because you're not doing something right, but you continue to do it continue to do it until it gets to the point where you might not even be able to hold your, be able to hold your pin on a target. It happens, right? And it's not that you're, us as archers and bow hunters, it's not that you did anything wrong. You know where the problem honestly comes from? People like me, as an archery dealer. Okay? And I'm taking full responsibility for that because I do a good job, and my people do a good job of taking you as a customer, you're, you need this setup, you need this draw length, you need this poundage, this bow fits good for you. This is what you need. Get you going, shoot a few arrows, set up your bow properly, send you out the door, right? You go to a box store, they don't even do half of that. They'll give you the bow and they'll send you out the door. That's where the breakdown be begins. Because if you're not understanding what you should be doing as an archer from the shot sequence, from your stance, and your body posture, your alignment, and what you should be thinking about, having a system in place, mental clarity, having trigger, having mental commands and other things to keep you engaged in the shot sequence, every time. That first time you get that shot and you punch that trigger, just 
started down that road. If you don't know how to get yourself back to square one and accepting perfection, and I don't want to say perfection in a bad way, but within acceptable reason of what your capabilities are, that's where you should be starting. Anybody know what this is on the right side of the screen here? It's a bad drawing of it, but anybody have an idea what that is? It's a draw force curve, okay? You sometimes you'll see an advertisement where they're advertising their bow. Our bow is the smoothest bow on the market. It builds pounded steady, and then it peaks, and then it jumps off into your valley. And this is your valley. One of the biggest problems that cause target panic is that bow hunters or archers do not know where they should be shooting from within this draw force curve. If you're building poundage, for example, this is a 70 pound bow. When you reach 70 pounds deep weight, you got 80% let off. This is that let off phase. Anybody shot an elite before? Got that bow sitting back there, feels like you can hold it all day long, right? That let off's more like 85%. The PSE's got it up to 90% where you're shooting from. What's one of the one of the common terms that I hear from customers? The bow feels jumpy. Feels like it don't have no valley, right? It feels like as soon as I get it back, it wants to come forward. Two things cause that. One thing is either your bow being out of time, being out of, if not tuned properly, or that's just the cam system. If you understand that this is where you're shooting from, but actually you should be shooting from here. And what that represents is, when you're shooting your bow, get back into that comfortable area of the draw of the valley and then you start putting all your focus back on your aim. One shot you may be pulling a little bit harder, you shoot your arrow. Another shot you might be breaking down a little bit, and you shoot your arrow. This is very this is a variation of variability you're introducing in your setup. If the variation of variability is bad in archery. You want consistency. When somebody says pull hard against the back wall, as you start pulling hard against the back wall you start to build poundage back up again. That's where a tension style release or a hinge style release is huge, especially if you need to start retraining yourself from a target panic standpoint. Why? You're going to be shooting from the same spot on the draw cycle every time. Anybody know what a tension release is? Or a back tension release? A back tension release or a hinge is slightly different than a tension. A tension. Sorry. Ah. Tension style release is designed on a spring. What you do is we take your, we identify what this poundage is on your setup. So if you're shooting a 70 pound bow, ideally 80% let off bow, you're going to be holding roughly 14, 14 and a half pounds of holding weight, okay? As you pull harder into that back wall, it's, it feels like it stops, and you start to build poundage quickly. We set a tension release to fire at roughly 16, 17 pounds. You check that on a spring on a scale. So when you start drawing that bow back, and you get into your valley, Different, it's got a safety, right? great release, great training release, take the safety off. And then all you're focusing on is pushing and pulling and aiming. Push, pull, aim, push, pull, aim. Until that, until that poundage builds and that shot fires. It gives you a surprise release. It teaches you what aiming is. One of the big, I talked a second ago about where the disconnect in archery is. Aiming it, just put the, put the pin in the center and pull the trigger, right? Is that aiming? Kind of a generic definition of what it is. But if you don't know what a, your sight pin looks like, what it should look like, and you don't know how to relay that to where you should be shooting that shot or execute that shot, there's a breakdown number one. So if you know that everybody has pin movement, everybody. I shot with some of the best archers in the world, and you stand look next to them as they're shooting, like you can almost set a cup on their bow and you don't think it would, it's moving. You wouldn't, you wouldn't see movement because their, their bow is that steady. But they have pin movement. Everybody has pin movement. Once you accept and understand that you have pin movement, and then you take the focus off of your sight, and you focus on executing your shot. I just, I just sat through a couple seminars at ATI. I love going to listen to some of the other people talk. As they articulate things differently. And uh, Joel Turner, Iron Mind Hunting, uh, he, he does his own training, training uh, system. A lot of it's on target panic. He, he articulated something very well, and as another archery coach, I really appreciate learning from other guys because, you know, when you're driving on the road, and you start to drive to the right side a little bit with you, you pull back to the left, right? You start driving, are you mentally telling yourself? Sometimes when you go too far, you're like, oh, I gotta get over. But you're just driving in the middle because you know that's what you're supposed to do. Your body automatically, your mind automatically centers what you're doing. But your mind's gonna do that with your pin as well. Once you identify your spot you're aiming at, level your sight, 
and you hold on there, you don't need to continue to keep focusing on there. You need to take your focus back, put that pin in the center, keep your posture strong to hold it there, and then start squeezing through the shot. That's how you're supposed to execute a shot. If you do it with a tension release, you're going to get a surprise release unless you cheat it every time. A hinge is something that can be fired similarly, but it's almost kind of the, the next step or progression in my opinion. I wrote this definition when I wrote that short booklet on, on buck fever. Buck fever is a moment slightly before or during the act of attempting to execute a shot on game which the hunter experiences an adrenaline rush that can cause both physical and mental disruption. Right? Whether you get to the point where you're in front of an animal and you freeze, you can't move, you kind of have a physical paralysis issue. If you get to, on, in the same situation and you're able to draw your bow back, but you can't hold your nerves and you can't hold steady and you can't, when do I shoot, when do I not shoot? Oh, then you smack the trigger and the arrow goes flying hits the tree. It's a mental disruption. That's a, it's an it's a anxiety issue. There's, there's, there's tips, there's tactics, there's self-hacks. There's so many little things you can do that start with creating good habits and understanding where you should be shooting from in your shot. Can you do that with the finger trigger? Yes. You need to learn how to do it properly. You need to be able to sometimes have some coaching to help you through that. Other times you can train yourself through that. But that's where things start. That's what people need to understand. It's not necessarily your sight. My pins are too big, my pins are too small. Uh, my, I've got too much draw weight, I've got too much holding weight. All those things are secondary to understanding the system and understanding how to plug yourself into the system, okay? Starts with knowing where to shoot your bow from. Um, lack of understanding where you should be focusing on, again, focusing on the shot and executing and staying strong in your shot and pulling through a shot. Real quick here. This next, uh, I don't have pens for everybody. If you have pens, I'm gonna hand this, it's just a little, no card, it's got a business card on it. Anybody that's sitting in here, that first book, target, Targeting Buck Fever that I wrote, I have a, a second edition that's ready to go out. I've modified, I've added a chapter because I was very excited getting that book out. And let's just say I punched the trigger. So I, I, I left the chapter out that, that, that needed to be there. That's there, that's, that's written out. I'm gonna be recording audio first, okay? So if anybody that's listening wants to send me an email, I want to send you the free audio version of that book, okay? Just send me an email, tell me you're here at the ISC seminar, and, and if you don't, I have more pamphlets, so they're just a note card, that, that's a little uh, exercise we're gonna do here in a second. But again, I've tied in, and I think it's more well-rounded now with that short book. Again, the audio notes are gonna be, uh, I'll send that to you for free, just as a, as a thank you for being here. Uh, this little note card on the back of it, it's got five numbers. If you got a pen to write with, great. If not, just start thinking about this, okay? I have some pamphlets if we run out of business cards as well, just for that email. Okay, so part of what I'm really excited about moving forward into this next booklet that we've written and into our training in our, in our online seminars, in our in-house seminars, in our workshops, are again, trying to take you as a, from a bow hunter from understanding how to make a shot, knowing what to do in the field, okay? The biggest thing that came back to me when I sent this email out to everybody for feedback was, how do I know what to do and when to do it? And my, my piece that I'm writing is, is on developing a system to help you determine your effective range and know how to plug that into you in the field quickly and keep you engaged. I talk a lot about blood fever and, and uh, target panic a lot of it's the lack of, 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 it starts with the mind, right? And if you, if you disengage yourself, that's where the breakdown starts. The key is being able to keep yourself engaged into a process, into a shot sequence, into understanding a system. And if that system happens to be applicable to the hunting situation, that's gonna help you stay engaged, it's gonna help you stay focused, and it's gonna give you purpose and confidence when you're in the field. So, if you have something to write with, number one, this is number one shot scenario. Okay, let's just say this, this animal right here. Ground blind, you're sitting in the ground blind. This animal is 10 to 25 yards away from you. That animal will have to be 20 yards away at that position. Is that a shoot or no shoot scenario for you? Okay, some people no shoot, right? Other people shoot. Some people no shoot. What? You know, it's quartering two, slightly quartering, probably walking slowly. 
Something to think about. Next scenario. Hope you don't shoot. You know, you know how to identify your animal. You're after target acquisition, right? Obviously, this is a no-shoot situation, but more for humor than anything. But hey, you need to be able to identify what's going on. Okay, here's your next scenario. You're standing next to a pine tree, somewhat brushed in. You're camoed out. Elk hasn't seen you. He's standing at 37 yards. Pretty much broadside. Is that a shoot or no shoot for you? Maybe, maybe not. What if you're shooting a 35-pound bow? What if you're a 24-inch drawling? What if you can't, if, you're, if you can't keep a decent-sized group at 40 yards? Is that a shoot or no shoot? Something to think about, right? Know how to plug yourself into the situation. Next, next scenario, you've got a deer walking slowly. You, you're again, standing behind a pine tree. These are game camera pictures, some of them, by the way. It looks like in the same spot, right? That deer uh, walking, right? 34 yards. Is that a shoot or no shoot for you? There's a lot to think about there. Smaller body size, where, how, how good of a group can I hold? Is that animal going to stop? Are you in a good position to make a shot as it moves further? So many things to think about. That's something that you should be able to determine what's going on there within a second. If it takes more than three seconds for you to decide what's going on, in any situation, it's too long. Last scenario I have to show you guys here. Bull Elk, he's walking, but right at that point in time, he stopped for a second. But I was, I was calling. This was actually on my, I, I videoed this, okay? This was a little further than 52 yards, that's why. I don't have this rack on my wall, but for the, for the conversation's sake, he's 52 yards. He stops. Is that a shoot or no shoot for you? You know, here's a, based off of what most people identify as yardage, I can shoot 52 yards, I'll smoke that sucker. What about his front leg? Pivot it back a little bit, right? What about the other thing? He's aware, he's looking at you. You think that he can't jump, squat, and then turn it, and now potentially arrow's gonna be outside the vital area based off of what happened between the time you shoot and arrow gets the target. This type of scenario, the situational archery is what we're kind of calling it. You need to be able to plug yourself into any situation at any time and identify shoot or no shoot, right? Is everybody the same? No. Is everybody gonna have a, a similar system? No, the system that I've kind of worked on and putting in place is not a the same for me as it is for Santino, as it is for Nate. It's not the same for everybody, right? It's this, it's gonna be where you need to shoot, use a realistic, structured format to determine your effective range, number one. Number two, break it down into a system to where we can identify quickly. Is it in my, my first third, my second third, or my, fourth, my, my last third of my effective range distance? From there, is this animal aware? Is this a shot angle I'm willing to take? Is this animal is my energy, is my kinetic energy momentum enough for that animal at that distance? All those things are very critical towards being successful, towards harvesting animals, towards, towards everything that is making your, your lifting to the next level, right? I mean, you want to talk about guys that are successful in the field? They don't think very much in the field either, whether they've had so much experience, whether they had, they've had so much interaction, I'll tell you that one of the biggest things that I am thankful for as a shop owner is all of my customers that come in the door and I've been able to work on thousands of boats, and see thousands of problems, and talk to thousands of customers over the years. I'm learning from every one of you guys, right? So I'm not here from, from the standpoint of authority or of I'm better than you. Hey, let me share what I've kind of, the data I've collected from all of us. And let's put it into a system and let's use that system so we can all be more successful. Because at the end of the day, it's important. Okay, for the people that say, ah, I go hunt for the experience, well, go camping, right? I mean, go take a camera with you when you go out. And don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to be derogatory towards people that, don't be, or that aren't successful, but what ha what's the, one of the first things that happen in today's day and age when somebody shoots an animal? Or, take a picture in social media, right? I shot this animal. I got this big old bull, I shot this big old buck. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. If it's done in the right mindset, if it's done with morals and ethics and a little bit of care involved, but it's important to be successful. You know, if you can set goals and you want to achieve things, let's do it. Let me show you how we can do it. I'll help you. I, like I said, this system I, that we've worked out, I've plugged every hunting scenario that I can remember in the last 15 years, every animal I've shot at, and it applied to every single one especially the ones that I missed on.
especially the ones that I wounded, especially the ones that didn't work out positive. So that's why I'm saying I'm excited about what we have moving forward because in today's day and age of YouTube and podcasts and, and everything else is that the people that are authorities in, in what we love to do in archery and bow hunting, there's not a very good system in place to show you. We take you from point A, let me show you what we do in the middle, let me show you how to get right toward the end, okay? This is that. It talks a lot about situational archery. We're going to be working on online classes. We're going to be working on this next booklet, audio form and book form. And then we're going to be doing workshops, full weekend workshops. We're going to take you, we're going to help you tune your bow and help you identify your, your flaws and your current setup. And we're going to take you outside in the range and we're going to sight you in. And you're going to determine your effective range. And then from there, we're going to bring you back in the shop. We're going to go through situational archery. We're going to go through repetition after repetition after repetition. So many different scenarios that you're going to know what you need to start thinking about. So come hunting season, it's not just a matter of, I can shoot my bow, I can hit a six inch group for 50 yards. There's so much more we're missing the point on. This, this, this system we're working on is just that. So mid-February, that next booklet's going to be ready. It's almost done now. I'm in formatting and I need a, for, for Kindle, there's a lot of things that go in the back of the back end for writing a, a booklet. Um, shoot or don't shoot. I had to change the title. My title didn't work the first one I said it out because people didn't know what I was trying to get to. I'm going to keep it simple, right? Shoot or don't shoot. How to determine your effective bow hunting range. Is that pretty much, I mean, tell me before I print this thing, is that pretty much what I'm trying to explain here in the last few minutes of the seminar? Better off, right? Okay. Thank you. I hope, I, I hope that's enough to... I, I hit the point on that. Lastly, I've got these pamphlets. There's a little clip I'm going to show you before I'm done here as, as part of what I'm excited about what we've been working the last few years in the Alpha Ball Hunting Challenge. My shop's on the north side of Denver. In this packet, we have our current offerings for seminars and workshops. Most of them are around 15 bucks. There is the Boat Tuning 3.0 class where we're going to take two people and one of my boat techs. I believe I have the best boat techs in the state. Okay? And I'm not including myself in that. I've got some guys that work on bows that are awesome. And from them being able to work on equipment day in, day out, and all of your equipment, some of these guys go into some of these training classes and training schools, I, I do believe that I have the best guys working in that facility in this in this, app, in this platform. But that being said, um, some of these classes are, are more one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one. -on -one. Those cost a few more bucks as time is valuable. Lastly, the Alpha Ball Hunting Challenge, alphaballhunting.com. If anybody has heard of that lately, we started an event two years ago where you build your heart rate just a little bit, put you in a high pressure situation, and it's a fun shoot. We got music playing in the background. We give, we give out this year, I think it's over $35,000 in cash and prizes. Next year, this coming year, we've got some extra elements that are going to set us apart from anything else competitive archery. I, I truly believe that. And I think that I want to show you a little teaser as to what our game looks like. It's just a quick overview. It's just a quick, uh, if I can get my computer to load, sorry. A uh, little teaser video on. All right, those guys are up next. Look for the hunts up next on the next seminar. I encourage you to stay. They're partners of ours for the Alpha Bow Hunting Challenge. But in our event, we've got a mirror image course, and okay, we've got five targets for each shooter. We've got a mild physical element in between each one. You're shooting with the backpack on, ladies 15 pounds, men 25 pounds. In this event, as you move away from each other, we're shooting at clay mission targets. It's fun to watch everybody shoot. This, this event, we have all divisions, traditional men, women, women. My son can be in this event this year. Again, some of the prizes, some of the events that we've incorporated into the game. It's one more tool to help you practice in that high pressure situation. If I can get this to go one more time just to show you that that head-to-head -head range. You know, again, the, the four, the, it takes two and a half minutes to three minutes to shoot around. You don't need to be in great shape. This is gonna help you just elevate your heart rate a little bit and show you what it's like that situation. So I encourage you to come out. Three of them are going to be up. I know we're going to be looking to be on the West Club but they this year. A uh, ton of fun. I mean, I, our, our lady champion, Kaylee, is that stand on the side over there. 
she'll tell you. She, it, it's, it's something that, that there's, not, there's really nothing like it from the standpoint of we, we have to, we have to quick and we we, uh, we put you in that element. So before I before I pass off the, the mic here shortly, back to Brian and, and the Fit for the Hunt crew. Again, Fit for the Hunt has a component in our element in our games. They're working out and they're doing prizes. I encourage you to stick around and listen to what they have to say. Uh, all encompassing preparation preseason. Anybody have any questions on anything we cover today or any clearing anything up? Any uh, Anything else, any other topics you think that we need to be talking about? Okay. That good of a job? Come on, guys. All right, thank you very much. Don't forget, send me an email. I'll send you a free audio book. Thank you, guys.